fascinated by uh, the info that this man gave us yesterday. Um, I'm more intrigued about the second day, so uh, Spectre in the building. Mr. Maddox, take it away. Make some noise, please. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thanks all for coming. Um, welcome back to those of you who were here yesterday. Um, thanks for coming again. Um, so today we're going to do something slightly different to um, yesterday's talk. Um, I'm going to go through a few of our Spectre tracks, but with an eye to talking about um, merging influences and bringing influences from different genres into techno productions. Because um, a very easy way to start making tracks that are a bit boring and derivative is to only listen to one thing. You know, if you just listen to the same style of techno or just techno all the time, you won't get any outside influences in. You know, you'll have a very narrow view of, um, of what you're doing. And which, you know, th there's nothing totally wrong with that, but it's likely that you're going to get bored of it and your productions will probably start to get a bit stale. Um, so bringing in sounds from a wider palette, you know, listening to lots of different music and potentially sampling uh, stuff from other styles of music um, can be a cool way to, yeah, bring different influences and different flavors into your music. Um, so I'm going to start talking about uh, using samples as a source of inspiration. So I'm sure most of you who produce all realize that just starting with a completely blank screen and just no ideas can be intimidating and, you know, not very productive. You can just start, you know, if you just start with a kick drum and a hi-hat and stuff, it's very hard to get a vibe going. You know, you've got the, the mechanics there, but not any real feeling. So what we often look quite like to do with Spectre stuff is start with a sample. You know, if we find an interesting vocal sample or a musical sample or something that either me or Rich, our work with, um, has found, and then use that as the start point. So I'm going to talk you through how we did that in a couple of different ways, actually, with this track called Needs and Wants, uh, which was out on Phobic Recordings last year, I think. Um, so I'll give you a quick little blast of what this sounds like. <laughs> So you can hear that it's built around that sort of nagging, repetitive, I need, I want vocal, uh, which was just a sample we found. I think it's off an old acapella or something. Um, but we liked the vibe of that. You know, it was, uh, it was a cool feeling, had a good, you know, it's got a good energy to it. Um, so this was the original, the original sample as it came. I need, I want, I need, I want, I need, I want you. I so we took that. I mean, we didn't change it very, very much, as you can probably hear. Um, but what we did was got that onto a drum rack in Ableton Live and just chopped out the bits that we wanted to use and put them on different pads. So we've got... So, I think that one's got the U on the end, actually. I want you. There you go. Um, and then just, I, I do it this way rather than doing it in, um, in an audio track. Uh, just because I'm a bit old school, really, I came from the background of using hardware samplers and uh, that sort of equipment. Uh, so this was the only way that you could bring vocal samples in. So I, I, that, I, that's what I used to do. I'd you know, get the vocal in, chop it across a few different um, keys on the keyboard or pads, and, um, and then just jam around. And I find it makes you a bit more creative with the timing, because if you just drop it in on an audio track, it'll automatically be there starting on the first beat of the bar, and it kind of locks you into... Um, you know, not really thinking about the rhythm. Whereas with this, I'd have these mapped to keys on my keyboard or pads on push or something. Um, and then I'd just set a kick drum going and have a jam around with it. So if we just solo the kick, it's going to turn the uh, whole floor up on there. So if we solo the kick and the vocal, this is basically how we started the track. So we just got the kick, jammed about with the vocal over the top. So we just had this. And straight away, the track's got a bit of a feeling to it, you know, there's not, there's two elements there, there's just a vocal and a kick drum. But whereas if you just had a kick and a hat or a kick and a clap or something, the track's got no character, you know, it's just, it's just noises. Whereas as soon as you start to bring an element like that that's got a bit of character, the track's immediately got a direction and a feeling and a vibe. So, um, 
we listened to that for a bit, played around, I can't remember exactly what order we did things in, but you know, added some drums and stuff in, and felt that it needed another main element to anchor it. So um, anyone who was in Cody's talk before actually uh, noticed he was talking about call and response, and that's exactly what we did here. So um, we need, thought that we needed another big element to bounce off the vocals. So we got this stabbing, which was, again, a sample, I think. Um, <laughs> So, dead simple, just playing on one note. Um, if we have a quick look at the sound, it was, ah, so it was two layers. So I've layered um, a sampled stab here, this sort of rave stab. Up with just a little synth from Yuhi Hive to thicken it up a bit. Um, I've done that in an um, instrument rack, as you can see which is, for anyone who uses live, it's a really good way of keeping your arrangement simple. So rather than having, um, if you were layering, say, two or three different sounds on top of each other, rather than having three different MIDI tracks with um, stab one, stab two, stab three, you can just put them all in one called stab and have the layers managed within the instrument rack, which um, it means that A, it's easier to treat them together with the same effect, um, and B, it means you haven't got loads and loads of channels um, cluttering up your, your arrange view. Um, so that was pretty simple, we didn't have to do a huge amount with that, and so just from those first three elements we had the basic vibe of the track going, so from that point on it was just a case of building the drums around it, which are, uh, I'll quickly go through now, but there's nothing particularly, uh, particularly unusual in the drums, so got just a big kick, 909 open hat, just a little bit of crunch on it, and a little sort of swishy background hat ride kind of loop thing that just adds a bit of, uh, bit of sparkle to the top end. Um, a little reverse hat, which just adds a little, little flick into the groove, and clap and a shaker, I think that's about it. Yeah, so just a little smallish clap. Again, using an instrument rack to layer two different things on, on top of it. So we've got this uh, Todd Terry snare and then a sort of crunchy clap over the top of it. And just some straight 16 shakers, which were just programmed in. Uh, again, two layers on there in an instrument rack. So we've got an actual sample shaker there and a little white noise thing from operator there to just add a little bit of hiss and brightness on the top. Um, so the drums, I mean, this track really, it's all about the stab and the vocal. The drums are kind of like pretty standard, really. You know, there's nothing, uh, nothing pretty, pretty that outrageous in the drums. Um, the bass line on this um, is a little bit different to what we do on a lot of our stuff, actually. Normally, if we were going to do a rumbling bass, we'd do it with filtered down kick drums or filtered down toms or something like that, like anyone who was here yesterday will see we did on, on that project. Um, but on this one, we wanted to do something that had a little, bit more, a little bit more pace to it. I think we were listening to quite a bit of stuff by Dax J and people like that, that slightly harder techno, which is harder than what we were doing here, but we liked the vibe of that sort of rolling synth bass. Um, so on that, we layered in... That's the bass. Um, and so, yeah, it was actually from a synth, which is not what we normally do for bass. So if I take all the, take all the effects off... Um, you can see what we've got. It's actually a patch in Diva. Like actually playing a kind of, uh, almost like a sort of fast arpeggio kind of thing really, but on a really low octave. Um, if you have a look at the MIDI, it's, uh, so it's kind of mainly centered around the root note, which was F sharp, but then with like a little descending bit at the end. Um, if I put it up an octave, you can probably hear what it's doing better. So it's that kind of a pattern, but then just dropped right down to a low octave and filtered. So you can almost not really tell what the notes are doing. You know, you, you kind of want that, you got to get a feeling of the notes that it's playing, but really to just feel like a big solid wall of sub. Which I think it does reasonably well. Um, 
So yeah, the effects on there didn't, didn't sound like they were doing a huge amount really. A little bit of side chain, a little bit of extra low pass um, using one of the new, well, they were new in Live 9 filters. If you can see on auto filter over there, it's on the SMP model, which I find a good little uh, tip that works really well on bottom ends. If you put it on SMP and turn the drive up a bit, like a lot of the time when you add overdrive to things, it'll take away bottom end, you know, because it adds the higher harmonics and sucks the bottom end out, whereas that SMP model is really good at actually emphasising the sub and the bottom end. So that's a good, uh, yeah, good little tip for the live users. And then just a bit more EQ after that. So that was, uh, yeah, that was the base. Um, so after that, that was the main, the main bits of the track in. There's a ride in there, but I think that's just a standard offbeat ride. Yeah, nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, but when we came to arrange the track, we found we would kind of run out of steam a little bit because if we brought the stab in too early, it gave the game away too soon. And you know, we, we, just, we were running out of ideas by three minutes. And if we had the vocal in all the way through, even though we liked it, it was getting a bit annoying. You know, you can't listen to it constantly for six minutes because it just got a bit wearing. So we thought we needed um, another sound to carry the intro, really, and sort of hold things together until we got to the, the meat of the track later on. Um, and we wanted to find something that had an interesting texture to it. Because, I mean, we could have put, like, a little synth arpeggio in or some chords or something like that, but we kind of wanted to do something a bit weird. Um, and I'd been listening to... Uh, this kind of goes back to my point about bringing inspirations from outside of what you normally listen to. I was listening to an album by um, Rasheen Murphy, who um, some of you may know. And uh, just one of the intros had this really cool little electric piano organ kind of chord on it, which was this. And I, just, I was listening to it in the car and I just thought, I really like the chords on that. So we just pinched a tiny little snippet of it here. Uh, this one. And you can see just sampled really small but little snippet from it. And I again laid it up in an instrument rack. Um, and all it is is the second chain in the instrument rack here is the exact same sample but pitched up an octave. So you get both octaves at the same time when you play a note. Um, and then again just jammed a little pattern on, on the keyboard and that gave us this. which it's kind of quite deep, which was what we wanted, because we wanted to hold something back before it got to the big, you know, the big stab and uh, vocal part of the track. Um, and it's also an interesting texture, you know, if you just used the preset off a synth or something like that, you probably wouldn't have got anything as odd as that. So we, we, we liked that, so we just had that rolling through. You can see it's this uh, selected channel here. So that kind of runs through the sort of middle part of the track leading up to where the stab comes in, which is the channel below. Um, and yeah, it just carries the track, so I'll just give you a quick blast of that in, uh, in context. And as we get a little bit further along, that just crosses over and uh, makes way for the main stab. So that's just filtering down on a low pass, so that it sort of gradually disappears just by the time we get to the break. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, most of the points on that one. I'm going to actually move on and do some different examples on another track, but does anyone have any questions about what I covered on that one before we move on? Yeah. Can I look at that clip from here? Yeah, you can, although I can't remember whether the individual parts are on here or not. Um, oh, there you go. I've, um, <laughs> you can even see where we nicked the layers from. <laughs> I should have renamed layers probably. <laughs> but, um, so um, we've got one from Dax J, as I said, or, or at least my memory is good, um, which is filtered down, I think, for just the bottom end. Um, oops. So, taking that, I think it's been pitched differently and filtered and saturated. I mean, I was talking about this yesterday. Um, some people might not say it, but I'm pretty sure every techno producer who I know samples things from other people's records. And I think as long as you do it in a creative way, you know, like you're not just taking their main riff or all their drums or something like that, I think. I don't have a problem with it. You know, if I heard someone had taken the sub layer from a Spectre kick on one of their tracks, I certainly wouldn't get upset about it. So I kind of, I uh, assume everyone else has the same outlook. Maybe not. Um, 
So that was the sub layer. And then the mid layer was from somewhere else. I oh, know, so there's two sub layers actually, so there's two on top of each other. Yeah. So actually, the, the, um, the first one that I've worked, just looking at the levels, the first one was actually quite quiet, so that's just adding a little bit of extra reinforcement. And then there's another one on the top there, which has been high passed, just using the filters built into um, Simpler to give it that little click and punch on the top. So yeah, that's the, 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 the way the kick was put together. So it's all about adding layers, and the main thing to bear in mind if you're doing two different layers that are both in the same frequency range, so like those top two are there, is to make sure you're getting the phase right. Because you can quite easily end up, you know, if you put two over the top of each other, like when you're doing a DJ mix, really, you know, you can, you'll hear the, the kicks cancelling each other out and reinforcing each other. So with getting the phase right, um, a good tip is sometimes you'll, you'll just drop on and I'll be right, but you can see on this one, actually, I don't know how clearly we'll be able to hear it on, uh, on this system, but I've put a, if you look on this one here, there's a utility on, which is inverting the phase of the kick, which is just because, if we just listen to those two. Yeah, you can hear that with the phase as it was, it actually sort of takes a bit of bottom end away because it's cancelling out, whereas then just flipping the phase makes it reinforce it. So that's trial and error, really. But um, yeah, if you put two over the top of each other that you think are going to work and it does the opposite of what you expected it to do, then try inverting the phase of one or the other and it, might, it may help, it may not, but it's a good, it's a good tool to try. Um, any more questions on that one before we move on? No? Cool. Okay. So um, just going to move on to another project now, which was, this one was kind of, uh, as you can see, we didn't really do that much to the samples, you know, it's a case of selecting them and dropping them in. Um, I'm going to move on to something a little bit more complicated now, um, which was a track on our second album called Steel City Sunrise, um, which will be loaded in a second, hopefully. There we go. Um, and this one, again, it was sample-based. We started with the sample as the, uh, the inspiration and the start point for the track. Um, but this one was a little bit more complex and a little bit less straightforward. So the sample on this one was from um, Nina Simone, which again is probably a less, less sampled techno gnome. Um, so if we have a quick look here, da, da, da. it's um, a track called Strange Fruit, which is a jazzy piano and vocal um, thing. Very sparse instrumental. Pastoral scene. And I was just listening to that again. Um, usually inspiration for these sort of things comes from listening to music not in the studio. I very rarely sit and hunt for samples in the studio. I'd be more, I just try and listen to lots of a diverse range of music when I'm not in the studio, like when I'm in the car or when I'm you know, doing, doing office work or whatever. Um, and just kind of keep notes, you know, something, if I like the tonality of something or I like the feel of something. I'll just make a note on my phone and, you know, to go back to it and listen to it again in the studio with an eye to doing something with it. Um, so with this one, as you can hear, the original is a piano and vocal um, together. So what we started with was the same principle as with needs and wants. So I took a few bits that I found interesting and put them on pads in the drum rack here. Um, so we had just a hit of piano there. Just a single word. Another piano hit. Another piano hit. And another little bit there. Um, so that was just done by ear, really. You can see that I've not, tr I've not really trimmed the samples down. I've just put them on new pads and messed around with the start point to find bits that I thought were interesting. Um, so then I put those together into this simple little pattern here. Um, in terms of processing on that, there's just a bit of reverb and a high-pass filter, so nothing too drastic. The reverb helps sort of uh, fill the gaps in between, in between the samples. So what we got ended up with there was this. So quite a nice melancholy but um, emotive little pattern. Um, at this point, we thought we quite liked it, but didn't really know what to do with it, because 
Um, although it's cool and a nice vibe, it's not really a big peak time club track, obviously, you know, it's, it's quite, quite down and, uh, yeah, emotive. Uh, but we were at the time working on Cyclic Operations, our second album, so we kind of thought, right, this maybe is one to sort of put aside as, a, you know, as an album track <laughs> that might not be a big club track, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, that was what we thought with it. So, at this point, uh, we actually sat on this idea for quite a long time and didn't really know um, where to go with it. Um, so, let's take the returns out. Um, and so the next step was to sort of try and get a few parts going around it that would make it a bit more, a bit more danceable, you know, I mean, we weren't about to make an ambient track. So we threw a kick behind it, as with needs and wants. Get the, uh, get the main part in. Sorry, bear with me. There we go. So yeah, we put a kick drum behind it. And as I was saying with needs and wants, just having, starting with a musical idea and a kick drum immediately gives you a vibe, you know, rather than just having one or two sounds, ideas start popping into your head when you've got something musical playing. Um, so we were quite a big fan of these sort of re drum and bass kind of bass lines. So we thought, let's try doing something like that with it. So I, with, I think it was Silence, yeah, just played in basically a held note bass pattern copying what those notes that we'd used in the, from the sample were, so. So you can see it's um, fairly straightforward. Um, it's just following what the root note of the piano chords on the sample are doing with just a little flick up to a high octave on that B on the, uh, on the second part there, which just added that little sort of bendy, hoovery kind of, uh, kind of thing. So, already that was sounding pretty nice. The sound on that was, as I said, from uh, Silinth. We just had it split into two different, uh, two different copies for the high and the low end. Uh, but it's basically just um, three, three detuned saws with a filter on. There's nothing particularly, uh, particularly clever about it. And a bit of portamento, so that you can get that bend between the two notes. Um, so then, that with the melody and the drums in was already sounding like you know, quite a good, uh, quite a good start point for a track. Added in some shakers and hats, a little snare, um, and some sort of bumping kicks. So I'll show you those. So yeah, with the bottom end, the drone bass that I just showed you was the part of the bass that gave it all the character. But it felt a bit slow, you know, because it's just held notes rather than anything with any rhythm. It made the track feel a bit too, you know, even for an album track, it felt like it was lacking a bit of pace for us. Um, so we just added in a few extra kicks. So these ones here that I've called double kick and bump kick. Um, so you can hear one of them is playing just before the beat. I'll show you the MIDI for it. So the bump kick, as I've called it, is kind of playing just before the beat, if we can find it. Yes, yeah, so that's playing just before every second beat. And then the double kick is another copy of the, of the main kick drum, um, but playing the extra sort of fill-in kick notes there at the end of every two bars. So if we play that with the kick, you can sort of hear what I'm talking about. And that's the same kick as the main one, but just filtered down. So I could have just programmed that on the actual kick drum channel, but it felt better to have it a bit more filtered down, you know, so it was a bit more subtle, a bit more subliminal, rather than being a really banging, you know, uh, sort of hard techno double kick kind of feel. Um, so yeah, th at that point, the hats and stuff we added in were fairly straightforward. And then it, at that point, it was just a case of thickening it up and adding, um, yeah, a few parts to just uh, add to, to, fill, to fill it up, really. So we did a couple more parts on the vocal. So I'll show you back on the vocal here. So the one that I was playing you before was this channel. Which is the one called Piano and Free. 
Um, and then we added a few other little cuts, from all cut from the same source. Um, just other little bits to thicken it up. So that one was, again, another, little, another sample from the same place, but pitched up. Uh, then I added that, the word strange, which was one of the original ones we had, but I just put it on another channel so we could process it a little bit differently. And pitched it down again. Um, just, so, just so you get that weirdness, you know, like the high bits and the low bits, rather than it sounding like a big sample uh, that had been lifted, you've got lots of different variations and things from it. And then I took another, cu another cut from the same place, and actually, rather than having it on a drum rack, had this one on just a normal simpler so that I could play it up and down the keyboard. Um, so yeah, this one, uh, if we have the MIDI keyboard on, you can hear you can actually play it up and down the keyboard like a sound. Um, so it's just a little, da, da, little two note part there. And then we were liking that, so we did some more of it, um, which was the same idea again, I think actually the same sample, uh, which is this bottom bit here. So all those together like, make quite a complex, complex little thing and it creates a, an unusual texture. I mean, this is, it's quite unusual compared to our other tracks as well, really. Um, but the point being that it can be just having one little idea, you know, we started off with just two little cuts from that, that track. It can just trigger off a creative process in a way that probably just sitting and thinking about it is, at least for us. Um, we wouldn't have had those ideas by just sitting and thinking about them, you know, by just experimenting and playing around with samples can be a really, really rich um, source of creative ideas. Um, another thing to just bear in mind with this, though, that I kind of touched on was that when you put something that's a little bit weird, you've got to be careful to anchor it with more typical sounds. Because if we'd have done this um, and then put a really weird kick drum with it, and a really weird bass line, it would have just been too odd, and nobody, including us, would have played it. Um, whereas, we, we made a point, the kick drum just used a big, solid, you know, typical techno kick drum, the little bumping bass things that I was just showing you before, making sure that they were nice and solid, and you know, the, the hi-hats, if we just listen to those, are kind of, you know, just, I think they're 909s and some shakers. <laughs> So yeah, we, were, we made a point of anchoring the weirdness with a bit of conventional as well. Um, uh, in fact, needs and wants that we were talking about before is the same thing. You know, the stab's kind of a little bit unusual. The vocal's not what you'd normally get in a techno track. But then we, the rest of the drums, you know, the kick, the hats, the shakers and stuff, are all pretty standard issue, really. So like, it's, a, it's a case of getting that balance. Because weird is good in that it makes the track more unique and more standout, but too weird is bad because nobody will play it. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, uh, a sort of something worth bearing in mind because it can be easy to get carried away, like certainly with Rich and I. When you start doing something weird, we'll be like, oh yeah, you know, we're doing something really groundbreaking and different here, and then we'll go back to it, we'll go back to it the following day and we're like, what is that? You know, you've got to sort of have half an eye on making sure that it's palatable for, you know, people that aren't you, <laughs> basically. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that one um, pretty much covered. I've got a couple of little quick things to talk about, but does anyone have any questions about that track before? I was um, just going to say, who determines weird? Um, good point. That's a fact. I mean, I guess different to what you normally do is the definition of weird in this context. But, um, but yeah, you're dead right. What may be weird for us might be thoroughly mundane to somebody else. That's entirely true. I mean, that, that is very clever. So how weirder did you get before you kind of broke it down like that, or did it...? Um, that, that part did didn't really get any weirder, but it was a case of thinking what to put with it. You know, so we had that idea there, and we liked it, even though it was a little bit odd. But we were then like, right, well, we need to still make this something that we would play, at least, you know, even if nobody else does. Even, um, the, even the bass line, this, you know, that looks like you played with that for a while to get that Definitely. Effect. And this, this was a track, we, we, we tend to actually work quite quickly with the Spectre stuff, me and Rich, but 
with this one, it was actually one of those ones that we kind of did that idea and then sat on it for a bit and then got, went off it and then went back on it again. You know, so it was one of those, you do sometimes get those sort of difficult bursts of tracks that can uh, take a while to develop, but um, we, and this was definitely one of them. Um, one other thing I actually forgot to mention um, was we really struggled with the arrangement on this and like Rich was the, uh, I should take the credit for fixing this. Um, so, because we had this bass line that's quite, emotive and you know it's like a nice chord progression um we didn't really know how to get into it we considered using it as an intro to the album so it just started with the the breakdown but thought that was a bit of a cop out um and because it didn't really work if we had that melodic bass line in from early on it had no impact when it came in after the break so we in the end actually sort of went back to our sort of minimal techno roots a little bit and had the same sound for the intro but just doing this weird pitch bend thing so this is the bass that plays in the early parts of the track. It's just one note of the same sound from later on, but with a gradual upward pitch bend on it. Uh, if we look, I should be able to sit. So yeah, it's just doing that. So it bends up over the first, uh, first bar and then holds flat for the second bar. And that just helped us to it just gave us something to put in the first half of the track, basically, so that then when it got to the bit that we wanted to showcase, it, you know, it sounded fresh and it was the first time you'd heard it. So, any more questions on that one? Yeah. Did you guys uh, originally start it with Rocket 24? Um, I can't remember, actually. It was there or thereabouts. Um, it, w it might have been a little bit faster or slower, but yeah, it was around about that tempo to start with, yeah. Which is quite slow for us anyway, really. We're normally sort of more like 128, 130, so... Um, yeah, but I think it was roughly that tempo, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Did you get the bass sound back or the uh, by yourself on the side? Yeah, that was programmed from scratch. So it was, I'll quickly talk you through it. Um, so there's two layers, but they're just split for processing. So if we just listen to one of them. Uh, where are you, bass? I'll just turn all the processing off for a minute so you can hear the, um, the raw sound. What's going on there? Ah, I'd, I'd actually forgotten how we did it. <laughs> so <there's, laughs> I thought we did it different. So the top layer is just some detuned saws, and the bottom layer, bottom layer is a sign. Actually, yeah, apologies for that. I forgot. <laughs> um, so yeah, the top layer we just started. It started with the um, Silent Init patch, which is basically, um, in fact, let's uh, let's do that. Uh, did, uh, preset. I've forgotten how to do an init. I don't actually use this very much anymore. So anyway, it basically. Um, we started off more or less as that, and literally just put the, the voices up to three, which is on the top left there, um, and turned the detune up. So you'd get that, and just turn the detune up, and that gives you that kind of classic Reese uh, kind of thing. And then, yeah, underneath that was just a sine wave, I think. So, I know, it was a saw, but it was just really filtered down, so that one, when you played it low down the keyboard, that adds the sub. So yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was the bass and then a bit of distortion, a bit of filter. And uh, yeah, that was basically it. Any more? Yeah. In this case, yeah, like if you've got a sample like that, I mean, obviously when you're starting, if we'd have wanted to do it a little higher, we could have just pitched everything up a bit or down a bit, but with that, the vibe from the sample sounded, sounded right. So yeah, we used that as the start point. It's a good point actually though, because um, again, like I was saying about it being difficult to sometimes start from a completely blank page, even just not having an idea of key can help lead in different directions. You know, so if you, um, yeah, play, have a little sample part in there and it's in F sharp minor or whatever, instantly that, you know, narrows your options, you know, because the problem with the blank page is that you can do anything, you know, there's a million things you can do, you know, however many different keys and scales you could do it in. Whereas as soon as you've got a sample in there, that starts, you know, limiting things down and making it, and limiting your choices is the best way to come up with ideas, really, because, like, yeah, like I say, a blank screen, you could literally do anything, which sounds impressive, but actually it's very difficult, you know, having too much to choose from is a big problem, whereas bringing things in and uh, giving you a direction can be a good way to sort of trigger ideas. Yeah. Does the quality of the sample matter? So that uh, your sample was empty? Um, it does to a point. I mean, um, 
It was, yeah, it was from an MP3. Um, I th I'm, I'm assuming it was a 320, but um, it depends where they're going to be because the things that you really lose with an MP3, I mean, a 320 is kind of all right-ish, but not quite as good as a, as a WAV or a CD. Um, but the main things that you would lose on a high-res MP3 are a bit of the top and a bit of the bottom. So if it's going to be in a track like this where there's always going to be other things layered underneath and layered on top, it's less of an issue, really. But like, for instance, if you were sampling a hi-hat or a sub-bass, then maybe don't sample that off an MP3, because you'll, you'll, you'll miss the bits that you need. And, uh, like, in your sample, you some sort of piss. Yeah, well, that's, that's the original recording. It's quite an old track, so I presume it was tape piss from the original, um, the original recording. Okay. But rather than try and get rid of those, we kind of like, quite like the effect it gave. You know, it sounds old and dusty and, you know, adds a bit of grit to it. So, a good point, really, with when you're sampling things, a lot of the time, there'll be parts that you don't want. You know, whether it's a bit of vinyl crackle or a bit of hiss, like on that one, or, or some other element. You know, like if you've sampled from a track and there's a bit of a pad behind the vocal or a bit of something else. You can do a lot of work trying to get rid of them, but usually, you're better off just owning it, you know, and like going, right, we've, that's what we've got to work with. There's a bit of pad in it or a bit of hiss in it and just make that part of the track, you know, sort of work with what you've got rather than fighting against it. But you also have it in a, in a break in the song? Yeah. Sure? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, da, da, da. So the break is here. Is a break important uh, for you, Paul, in your productions? Is what, sorry? Is a break important for you? Um, usually, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of techno where there is more rolling and more DJ tool type, but because both Rich and I come from a background of... Um, we, neither of us came from a techno background, really, so I was into trance and UK hard house and things like this, where the break, you know, the break is everything, you know, the, big, the break's the big moment of the track. So um, we've done tracks that aren't really centered around a break, but I think it's kind of quite hardwired into both Rich and my brain to, um, to think about, you know, breaks and build-ups and stuff. So that's just kind of how our styles evolved, really. So, so as, a, as a DJ, then, also, mm. is, is the break important for you? I mean, obviously, you know, if, if, if you understand what I mean, for, for a young, uh, up-and-coming techno producer, would you, you know, they obviously have to find their own way, but, you know, is it important, a break? I'd say yes, but not always. I mean, in a lot of genres, you know, if you were making trance or EDM or um, a lot of other genres, the break is everything. Whereas I'd say in techno, it's probably, even though our, our particular style does use breaks quite a lot, I'd say it's less important. You know, there's a lot of great techno out there that's just five minutes of a groove, you know, with like, take the bass out, drop it back in, and they can be brilliant tracks. So I'd say it's more about finding your own style. I mean, if you, if you like big breaks and big build-ups, make big breaks and build-ups, but it don't feel like it's something that is like non-negotiable, you know, you can, it's, it's a matter of choice, really. Um, yeah? Did you have to clear that sample? It's very short. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, so yeah, any, uh, the, there was a couple of other little but there was nothing uh, major, so I mean, we're kind of uh, coming up to our time there. So has anyone got any, any final Things they want to query me on or uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, I've only dabbled in Max for Live a little bit. Um, I use the convolution reverb. That's one of the ones that comes with uh, the Max for Live Essentials from Ableton uh, quite a lot. I'm not sure if it's in this project or not. Um, but the only other one that I use quite a lot is actually um, where are we? Put my favorite. It's the one that um, I made myself. I think. Hopefully, it's in here. Um, Ah, no, I haven't got it on this computer. But um, yeah, the, the convolution reverb is one that I use quite a lot. The LFO is one that I use quite a lot. It's really handy, um, which it's just an LFO device, but you can assign the LFO to anything in your project, which is really handy. You know, like you can automate little filter sweeps with an EQ and things like that, which could be, could be quite cool. But yeah, to be honest, I've sort of only scratched the surface of Max for Live, really. It's, like, it's really powerful and there's some great stuff out there, but I'm, I'm a long way from an expert on it myself. Um, Mick, on uh, mixing and mastering, mm. with regards to finishing your tracks, yeah. do, you, do, you, do you guys do it yourself test, or do you Yeah, do it exactly it? that. So I'm quite a firm believer that getting the mix right is the most important thing. You know, like, if you get the mix spot on, a master engineer shouldn't really have to do a huge amount to your track at the end. But we do do a rough master ourselves to play out, just, because, just to get it loud. You know, if you play out a pre-master alongside mastered tracks it's just even if even if you've got everything right it's going to sound shit basically so um but yeah typically we would just put 
Um, just a limiter, usually. Maybe a tiny bit of EQ, but just a limiter. I use um, Vox Ango Elephant is my limiter of choice, but you know, they all do. They all do much the same thing, really. Cool. Is that everything, everything covered? Anybody no else? More? Any questions? I'll, um, I'll stay around for a few minutes at the end if anyone's got any questions they want to ask me um, like off mic anyway, but yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much. Paul Maddox. Thank you very much, sir.